Welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. I'm Pookie Knightsmith and I'm your host. Today's question is, why do some kids misbehave? And I'm in conversation with Mike Griffiths. Mike leads the primary and secondary response to behavioural management for the Royal Borough of Greenwich, providing assessment, outreach and nurture throughout the primary phase and the main SEMH provision for some of the most vulnerable pupils, both within and across boroughs. In this episode, we explore the reasons that underpin distressing and challenging behaviour in children and young people. Um, Well, I'm Mike Griffiths and I have the most ridiculous job title of being the executive head teacher of the Imperium Federation. I ran both Waterside with primary for SEMH children, which means social, emotional, mental health. And I also ran King's Oak, which is the secondary version of Waterside. I run all the exclusion and six day provision for the borough. I also run a complex ASD unit and I run an outreach service that goes into every primary school within Greenwich and works with children by trying to help them stay within mainstream settings before their behaviours become really interesting and they have to come to one of my buildings. When do you sleep? That's a lot of jobs. I, 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 I don't. I'm, I'm, I'm not a big fan, but there, there, is, there is some parts of me that are very much like Margaret Thatcher. And I, have, I survive on about three and a half hours sleep a day. Mm. Any longer than that, I become quite irritable. <laughs> so I, don't, I don't do sleep well. Don't come looking to me for a lion. It doesn't work. <laughs> and in fairness, I think I've kind of noticed that because I do see sometimes responses to you on Twitter um, at those silly hours in the morning when I expect only to be speaking to my friends in foreign lands. But there you are. Um, yeah. Did you kind of, you know, was this the dream? Did you growing up think, do you know what I'd like to do all day? Work with really, what do you call them? Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the dream was to go into the arts. Um, I wanted, to, I, my degree was in linguistics originally, and I wanted um, to go and become a translator. Um, I had this giddy notion that being um, able to speak millions of languages and sit in a box somewhere and talk to high-flying people was interesting. And then worked out that talking about the common fisheries policy really wasn't that interesting. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So um, I fell into teaching, um, mainly inspired by my aunt, um, who had been ridiculously my head teacher when I was in middle school. Um, and discovered a love of primary. I really enjoyed early years Mm -hmm. and this was at a time when Foundation Phase, as it is in Wales, um, was starting and I I grabbed that with both hands because at the time male primary teachers were really year five and year six and they didn't have them in early years and I wanted to be different and I really wanted to learn how children began their career in in education, how they learned to read, because by the time they got to me at the end of their journey, most of those things had been done. Um, And that started me off. um, And then ridiculously became um, a deputy head without trying. That is a very long story, so we're not gonna go into that, but I was sent sent by my then head teacher to go for an interview as a practice. Oh, okay. Way out of the county, so that if I made a fool of myself, nobody would know. And they gave me the job and I had to move um, <laughs> nice. from North Wales to South Wales. So that was, that was not expected. Um, and I became the head teacher of that school very shortly after becoming deputy, um, not through design. Um, but then my career sort of meandered by going into different people's schools and making them work. And it was just by chance that I'd seen Waterside advertised a few times so it made me think that they weren't getting who they wanted Mm. I didn't know what it did I didn't know what it was Um, and I turned up here and the borough won't mind me telling you this but they didn't show me the children and they didn't show me the building and they didn't show me the staff well when you came to see when you came to see it what did they show you so I was shown the next door school which was a mainstream school, okay. and I didn't know. I, and I, and you know, I've been ahead for a long time. I know it's difficult to believe looking at this very youthful face, but I've been ahead for a very long time. Um, and I didn't, I didn't think that was unusual. That I, you know, I did my lesson observations in a mainstream setting, and 
Um, it was only on day one when they allowed me to come in that I recognised that five-year-olds running down the, scissors, down the corridor with scissors at me and screaming obscenities was not where I'd come from. And I <laughs> can't this anymore. <laughs> but now, now I wouldn't change it for the world because I, I in all of my headships, I, I think I've made a difference in, in the vast majority of the places I've been to. But I've been lucky and fortunate enough to see how the work we do here and now at the secondary really does impact on not just the child but the family and the community and gives them life chances that I didn't expect them to have before. So I'm 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 really proud of that. Even though I'm tired, I am really proud of it. <laughs> so how long have you been there? Um, I came to Waterside in 2015. Um, Waterside was not the building it is now. It was okay. um, very different and children weren't in the best spaces that they could be. And they were in a, in a position where um, they weren't really educated okay. um, very well. And there wasn't an expectation for them to do very well. Um, but during the first two years, um, we managed to turn the building around. We started to return children back to mainstream and they've been very successful. They're doing their GCSEs and, and doing incredibly well. Um, or they've gone into vocational training. Um, and then two years ago, I was given the secondary school. It, it had a different name when I was given it. Um, it had been in requiring improvement for a long time. Oh, and wow. was covering into special measures. Oh. And in three and a half terms, we turned it into good with outstanding features. How? By not sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's basically it. Um, I think the methodology that I introduced here at Waterside worked really well, which was that you have the same expectation, if not higher, um, of what children can do. Mm -hmm. um, that there is a consistency with behaviour and how you deal with behaviour. And that you make them believe and feel that you are there for them, that they're held in mind with you all the time. And the secondary model is exactly the same. So at Key Stage 3, um, it's run like a primary school. So they, they stay mainly in their one classroom with their teacher and a TA. Um, they go out to food tech, science um, and PE, but the rest of their day is, is mainly within their classroom. And then Key Stage 4, um, which is year um, 9 upwards, they go and do all the options like they would do in a mainstream secondary. They have a uniform and the expectation is really high. We do subjects that um, our mainstream colleagues have dropped because of league table issues. So we will still do statistics in maths. And okay. um, that's a really complicated thing to get GCSE. And we succeed at GCSE oh, statistics. Wow. Um, Why? Why do you do it? To prove a point more than anything else. Because the sort of children that I play with are already removed from the system mm -hmm. and are not expected to be part of anything. They're always going to be on the outskirts of the world and also their families. So they'll have found primary school very interesting and not, not, not where they should be. Um, if they haven't come to Waterside, they've more than likely been excluded quite a lot. Um, if they've managed to go to a mainstream secondary, then most of them won't have survived um, past autumn one in year seven. Perhaps they will get to the end of year seven, just starting year eight. And then they fall out of education and they go to alternative providers or they don't go to mm -hmm. alternative providers. And they end up finding a pathway that you don't really want them to find. Mm -hmm. So bringing them in and giving them the, the power to choose their learning and tell you, you know, this is what I'd like to learn. This is what I want to become and then actually providing that for them, that, that gives them a bit of power and a bit of kudos. And, you know, in the two years that we've been there, my head of school and I have gone from having no data to report at the end of Key Stage 4, to now having GCSE grades as an equivalent, if not better in some cases than their mainstream counterparts. Wow. And they're going on to training, they're going on to further education, um, and their families are settled. And during this entire pandemic, I don't know how proud I'm supposed to be of this, but I am really proud of it. Thank you. <laughs> um, not one of my families were referred to social care, and not one of my families were referred to the MASH process, 
and not one of my families has been in trouble with the police during the entire lockdown. I am so proud of them. You have no idea how wow. proud that's made me because two years ago, they wouldn't have been in that state. So that, yeah, we've worked hard. You've worked really hard by the sounds of it. Do you have a kind of typical child or family that ends up with your school or is it very diverse? I think most people would like to think that they are white British boys in the main, mm -hmm. um, where mum is either a single parent or dad is a single parent, and where they may not have training or education to a level that you'd hope, yeah. or they may not be in employment. Um, I do have some of those families. Um, I also have families where mainstream have failed them dramatically and that that's a mixture of both the mainstream setting and the, the family not wanting to engage and have been part of that circuit of social care um being on things and not on things etc um but i do have middle class families who've got children who've got interesting behaviors that need mm -hmm. to be helped and supported so it is quite diverse um, the vast majority of the secondary is um, BAME, um, mm -hmm. but that's, that's changing more in the past two years. We're going more um, white British through yeah. the door. Um, but it's the first time in that school's history um, where parents are actively choosing them to send their children, rather oh, wow. than send them into mainstream and fail. They'd rather them come through our system and then succeed. So. Wow. Yeah. And so the thing that the children who are schooled with you have in common is perhaps that mainstream isn't the right place for them for whatever reason. Yeah. Tell me more about that. What, what, you know, what, in what way you talked about mainstream failing some of these kids? I mean, what, what does this look like? What, what state are they in when they get to you? Um, it depends. So if I take a, if I try to find a typical child, which is really difficult in SEMH because they're all really interesting. Um, they will, if they're in primary, they usually have got to about year four, um, uh -huh. where school has tried everything. So let's let's presume the school has given full full weight behind what this child is displaying. So they may be uncooperative, they may have been destructive, they may be violent, um, they may be a bit sweary, um, they may have enjoyed tipping tables over all sorts of stuff, and they'll have been given short fixed term exclusions of one, two, three, five days. Yep. And then somebody will have recognised that this isn't settling down. And the usual routes for them is usually that they, they, they bring out two magical words. So they bring out ADHD mm -hmm. or ASD, because that covers absolutely everything. That explains every child's behaviour. All children ever, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And actually it doesn't, because an ASD child's behaviours are very different from an SEMH behaviour. Mm -hmm. um, there are some overlaps, but you can normally spot when it's linked to their ASD and when it's not. And then they usually go on a treadmill for an EHCP. Um, and then they usually end up being given either one to one support, which doesn't work because you shatter that poor TA's life by giving them that one very interesting person for day in, day out. Or they end up coming our way. And, and actually what they need to do is to intervene earlier. Because that yeah. child will have displayed behaviours in reception, in nursery, um, and getting professionals involved at an earlier stage, the vast majority of them can be settled mm -hmm. unless they are really diagnosable behaviours. And if it's stuff that's happening at home, then you've got a chance to work with social care and work with the family to get things changed. But the older they are when they come to us, the more complex it takes. So we we estimate that it takes between six to nine weeks for us to unpick one type of behavior okay. and that can change uh, as we unpick it so it can it can it can take a year to unpick two behaviors quite easily um, and to make them settled so what kind of behavior when you say unpick a behavior what what sort of thing so if they are if we go to the extreme, so I have I have behaviours that most people would hope they would never see in a classroom. So if you've got children who will go from 0 to 100 for no apparent reason, but mm -hmm. there is always a reason, mm -hmm. um, and they become hyperviolent, so that might be that they will bite, kick, punch, spit, 
turn tables, throw things through windows, attack teachers with scissors or whatever implements they have. For us to work out why they do that, we have to unpick that behaviour before it starts. So we need to see it. Mm -hmm. You know, when somebody tells me that they've got the worst child ever, I've got a, an entire school of the worst children ever, allegedly, but that my children are in at this precise moment and there's a classroom behind this wall and you can't, can't hear, hear them, mm -hmm. but they're all in and I haven't put them in gauges. Um, we then have to unpick it. So we watch why they, they did what they did. And the reason we are a success at this is because we consistently and methodically track every single element of their day. Okay. So if, for example, there's a young man who's next door, um, one of his, his tells that let you know that his anxiety level is rising is the fact that he'll get his pen and he will take the lid off and click it. But he clicks it only an odd number of times. So if he does four, nothing's going to happen. Nothing. But three, you know that he's starting to feel a little bit anxious. If you don't pick that up then, then he moves on to tapping something three times and then it goes. So wow. you have to work out, right, I've heard you click that twice. So once you get to twice, oh, what can we do to help you now? What am I going to do to stop this game to a point that you're going to get interested? And what you need to do is unpick it to the point that they start to feel what they're feeling. Because a lot of SEMH children can't really differentiate that the good feelings that you want them to have as opposed to the negative ones. It all feels exactly the same. They, they're just enjoying that heightened state. So okay. you need to work out how to get them to understand that that's a point for them. And then they get to a point that they can ask you and say, I need help before it gets to that bit. And so the young man next door has been with us since September and he's had lockdown in between, but we've worked with him consistently throughout. And his last interesting moment was in January. Oh, wow, wow. And he's now on a pathway to going back to mainstream in October. We would have had him in in September, but unfortunately we've not been able to throw him into anybody else's schools. But he's going, he's going back in October. Because presumably really, that transition has to be dealt with really carefully. Yeah, it takes seven weeks for us to transfer them in successfully. If we go too quick, it goes a bit wrong. Yeah. Um, and we have a set plan per child. It's very individualised. So we, we work out what their main strengths are and yeah. we put them in those lessons first so that yeah. they feel that they are an expert. Yeah. And then we put them in the things that they're not that comfortable with. My staff will go with them for the entire seven weeks. Wow. And then that school, who's been kind enough to take one of mine back, both at primary and secondary, get um, my senior leadership and my support for a year free of charge. So if that child wobbles, yeah. um, before they exclude, we demand that we are contacted and then we arrive, we help reset the behaviour we sit in the meetings so that the parent and the child know that there is somebody who understands and listens and isn't against them. And then we can normally put it where it should be. Wow. So talk to me a bit more about what, what is happening with kids who are arriving with you, whose behavior is interesting. I mean, why does that happen? Why, why are some kids naughty? I'm going to stop you with that word. That Go on. Naughty. That, that word is a naughty word. Naughty is when you've told everybody you're on a diet and you go into the staff room and you eat five biscuits and don't tell anybody. Really naughty is when you go in the staff room, you eat the entire pack and then you go back in later on and go, which greedy pig has eaten all of these? <laughs> That's really naughty. Behaviour isn't naughty because I'm not a big fan of saying that behaviour communicates mm -hmm. all the time. It can do, but sometimes, you know, as a grown-up, I can make myself interesting just because I feel the urge on that day. You know, I want to be grumpy because it's giving me that feeling. So it's not communicating, I'm just making myself feel that way. Um, for children, I mean, there's, there's some research that was done in MSU by um, Tracy Abram, and she came up with a HALT method, which was that you could categorise behaviour in four ways, mm -hmm. which was that most people demonstrate behaviours if they're hungry, angry, 
lonely, stroke, bored, or tired. Okay. And it's quite simplistic because I can be hungry, but I will still be quite a nice person. You know, I can be bored, but I will sit through it and look pleasant because I've learned social convention. So yeah. I can understand why that research took flight because it was used quite a lot recently in America um, because it sort of gave people um, a rationale for why they were being less tolerant and more irritable. Um, but actually in children, I think there is this, this, that bit doesn't quite work so well because they haven't got the experience level either. So mm -hmm. a child may be hungry, but that doesn't necessarily mean that their behaviours will alter. Um, they just may continually nag you for food. Mm -hmm. I think you have to look wider than that. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's down to us as a society. And I'm not saying that behaviour has changed dramatically since the 1920s, 1930s, but I think what has changed is how society deals with children. So okay. you go from a model where children were seen and not heard, to a model where children's um, opinions are the centre of everybody's world, and then there's no crossover, there's no Venn diagram. So you're either quite, you're quite binary on that. I think to simplify it, I think when they walk through my door, it's quite easy for me to work out what type of parent I'm meeting um, and where the behavior may be starting to be ingrained. So if we take out the diagnosable stuff, yeah. so if we take out the things like um, ODD, ASD, ADHD, all of that, if we mm -hmm. take that out of the way, just normal, misbehaviors um sometimes it's down to children not understanding what you've asked and that can be either deliberately not understanding or the fact that they they really don't understand so that could be that the parent has made a sentence so complex when they've asked them to do something that they don't know where they've started um children are really good at being rewarded for their misbehavior and i find parents get that really really wrong Okay. So, um, so take the sticker charts out of the way, but if I was your child, Pookie, and I wanted a snake, for example. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> I may not be the sort of child that would write a rational argument mm -hmm. and, and present that to you. I may be the sort of child that would nag the knickers off a nun at you <laughs> when you begin. And I will have learned from looking at the world around me that if I continually nag, and if I continually request, and if I continually whine, eventually you give in and give what I want. And so you're rewarding that behavior. Yeah. And so once that behavior has been rewarded once, then they know that they can get away with it again, and again, and again. That's why when you see um, toddlers lying down in supermarkets, kicking and screaming, they may not really know what they're doing, but they do know that by doing this gets the reaction that they're looking for, which is yeah. I will get full attention and I will get something. Yeah. So that then translates further and further up as they get older. Yeah. And so they learn that they can control and manipulate grown-ups. And if they can do that to their, their parent or their guardian, then they can do that in class because a class teacher will have 30 of them. Yeah. And it's not going to be prepared to deal with somebody whining and whinging at them all day. And why would they not just ask nicely? <laughs> because they haven't learned that. Okay. So, you know, we would all like to think that children are given clear role models for language and behaviour. But actually, they're being given so many cues at the moment from both home life, social media, gaming systems. And I'm not laying the blame at, at media in any shape mm -hmm. or form. Yeah. But... Children now have far more social cues than we did. So if you take back to my generation, you know, I had four channels on my television um, eventually. There wasn't a lot of interaction. I didn't have computers. Whereas now they are bombarded with, this is how you behave. This is how you get this. This is how you yeah. get that. And so they've learned these things. And so either you've got a consistent parenting model at home where that parent has a very set guidance for them so you know you will get this if you do this this will happen if you do this I will not accept this or you have parenting that wobbles between it or you'll have parenting at the other end of the scale where they just give in entirely you've also got that whole toddler bit that some children don't grow out of and some grown-ups and I'm certain you've met them as well Pookie who test your boundaries on a daily basis 
And some people really do get off on just testing boundaries. They really enjoy that feeling of watching another person have to manage it and deal with it. Mm -hmm. And they are getting feedback on that because they're getting the control back. They've made you do that and then they, you, they are making you do it even more. And ridiculously, the thing that people either jump to first or they forget, so depending where your brain is, is about trauma. And a lot of our children have experienced trauma now at a level that they've never experienced in yeah. history. And I'm, I'm very guarded with the word trauma because we're a trauma-informed school, but there is a level of where their anxieties have become learned behaviour as a response to that anxiety. Um, they, they will have attachment issues um, because they're looking for somebody to keep them physically and emotionally safe, and they may not be getting that from the people that they live with. They may not be getting that from the class teacher. They may not have got that from the school that they went to. And so that all builds up into a pattern of, I can now do this in order to make myself safe. I can do this in order to control the world around me. And if we're all honest as grown-ups, we still all do those things. It's just that we've got some level of social convention that makes us realise that we shouldn't really throw ourselves on the floor in the supermarket. Um, though sometimes I feel I should. Just <laughs> It's tempting, isn't it? Yeah. So... It sounds like there's a lot here in terms of what we're seeing in, in, in children's behaviour that comes back to, to parents. I mean, are they the key influence here or what role does early schooling have to play? And I think, I think parenting is important and it can't be negated mm -hmm. because there are some experiences our children will have witnessed at home that I would have hoped nobody would have ever witnessed. Yeah. You know, they will have witnessed domestic violence. They will, have, they will have witnessed drug abuse and substance abuse. They may have witnessed self-harm. They may have witnessed suicide. They may have witnessed not having what their friends have and watching mum or the guardian go out to get it in ways that you and I would hope that we would never have to accept that another adult would do. Yeah. And so there, there are things that you can't control. School can be the one place for those sort of children where they can behave and be safe yeah. and for them to recognize and to notice that there is a different type of adult and a different model and that's not judging that parenting but that's just demonstrating that there is a grown-up who is safe who is secure who listens who isn't going to hurt them who does what they say they're going to do whether that's a good thing or a bad thing yeah you know, if, if you've done something wrong then there's a consequence, but there will be the same consequence regardless of who you are. And sometimes school is the saviour for those children. And I, I see currently my outreach service, which only has 10 staff. Um, we did start off with 23 when I came in 2015, and now due to funding, we're down to 10. Wow. And we see 174 children a week. So we, we had to reduce to 10 because funding stopped dramatically. Um, but the need hasn't changed, unfortunately. Um, and so we now work with over 174 children a week. And I take on the more complex cases along with um, my head of school at the primary. But we, we are noticing that children need an adult that holds them in mind. And so our training now is, is all about getting them to see nurture, not nagging, um, and how they can help these children through these interesting behaviours. Because if you can unpick them early enough, then the vast majority don't need an EHCP, and the vast majority of them don't need to come into specialist provision. They will need checking in. They'll need people who will pop in and say, how are you? I notice things are a bit wobbly. But they're not going to need that full gamut of specialist intervention. Okay which will free up the, the system because, you know, at the moment, um, Waterside has a waiting list of over 70 to come through the door. And at the secondary, we, for some unknown reason, we have a glut of 30 year 11s oh. that are waiting to come through the door. Wow. Um, and we can't, we can't work with them. We just don't have the facility. But um, yeah, it's, it's the, the, the need is there. But actually, if we were able to intervene, intervene a lot earlier those year 11s wouldn't be where they are now 
And you talked before about having an interest in what happens from the very early years and how that shapes, you know, how a child learns to read and so on. But presumably that's very much uh, the case here as well um, in terms yeah. of setting those early behaviours. And I think that's down to school ethos and behavioural policy. OK. And I think, I think there has to be a shift. There's got, I'm, and I'm hoping, out of this ridiculous time that we've been in, yeah. that people's attitude towards behaviour is going to alter. Okay. Because some, some people's behavioural policies are very punitive yeah. and it's against the child. And what you need is a behavioural policy that supports the child. It can't be all singing, all dancing and fluffy and light with no consequence because people need structure. And children yeah. love routine. Children yeah. love structure. Um, they may kick against it every now and again, but they do like to have a structure. And I'm hoping that the pandemic has actually unleashed something within most schools to say, actually, our, our planning for this doesn't work. You know, a sticker chart isn't working. Mm -hmm. um, a rewards thing isn't working. Um, why, am I, why am I excluding children? Because they've, they've voiced why they're unhappy. What can we do better? And I think what changed at Waterside and at King's Oak was the mindset from the staff. Okay. So instead of blaming the children for the behaviour that they were seeing, we blamed ourselves because we needed to work out why we hadn't spotted it. That's our job. So you know, as Paul we, Dix would tell us, when the adult changes. And it works. It, 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 it sounds really simple. And some people come on that journey really readily. Yeah. Some don't and some you have to lose. But the reality is if you can't sit down and go, oh, I really made that difficult for you today. I know you find maths difficult, so why have I given you this in this format? And now, I, now I'm cleaning up a table and having to ring your mother and having to do lots and lots of stuff that I didn't need to have to do if I'd worked this out beforehand. Mm -hmm. um, which is why our consistency with our tracking for each child works. And when we go into a mainstream setting, we ask them to do it for their interesting child for the fortnight. Because over the fortnight, you will see the behaviour pattern quite quickly. And then you can say to them, well, when you've told me there were no triggers, you've shown me them. You've shown me them. So how can we unpick it? So is that like when you're doing that tracking, is it that you're noticing that these are the warning signs that this child's behaviour is going to escalate? Or is it saying, hey, do you know what? This child tends to go into meltdown in maths because they find that hard. So from, it's different to the, to the model we use at both the special schools. Uh -huh. so what we will give out to a mainstream school. So in a mainstream school, we ask them to show when that child's behaviour escalates, because we're not going to expect them to unpick it all in one go. No. And we have to remember they've got 30 children in a classroom. So there's a lot for them to deal with yeah. rather than just that. But we've made it really simple. So it's colour coded and it's tappable. So they can have it on any device. They don't have to do anything complicated. The document is shared between the school and myself and my head of school. So we monitor it. Mm -hmm. Um, after the first couple of days, we will then ring them back and say, we've noticed that whatever you're doing at period three is when things start to get a little bit interesting. And usually they tell you, oh, well, we excluded them after that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you're like, oh, OK, I have worked it out. Um, and then we can design our training to help support them. So for, for like um, primary, it can be as basic as how a child goes into a hall. Um, you know, going into the hall for assembly, which they're not going to have to do for a while, so that's going to really negate it for some children. But going into the hall for assembly can really be a big trigger because they go from being in a small confined space where they feel fairly secure to then going into a larger space where there's a lot of people and they can't level out their anxiety. That's, that's not just kids. I struggle with that, like as an adult who's autistic. Me too. Like, and I mean, you've seen me, you've seen me at the LGFL conference and I was triggering continually during that because it petrifies me going from being in a small contained space where I feel I'm in control yeah. to suddenly having an audience and they're waiting for me. But suddenly I can do that in assembly with my children. No, no drama at all. You could have everybody in there, no problem. Mm -hmm. But put me in front of my peer group. Yeah. It's be quite in interesting to play with. And so we teach them how to role play that and how to rehearse it so that that level of behaviour comes down. It won't go away immediately, but you, you lower the anxiety level and do it on days when you haven't got the vicar in. 
because that's usually when things go really wrong. <laughs> what are you trying to say about Vickers, Mike? <laughs> Nothing at all. But it's usually, it's usually when you've got somebody who doesn't normally deal with children in that way. Suddenly yeah. have, you know, and the tension level of every member of staff knowing that that interesting child is in that room who could blurt out the most beautiful, beautiful sentence of obscenities to somebody who may be quite shocked that <laughs> You know, that the, the tension level goes up and the children feed on it. And if they're already anxious and they can see you're anxious, that just escalates it. So you need to real role play that to bring it down. It's the same as bringing them in from playtime. You know, if you know they can't line up, then why are you making them line up in that way? <laughs> why haven't you worked this out? You know, if they can't stand behind somebody, then don't let them stand behind somebody. Bring them to the front so that they, they are standing in the front or put them next to somebody who you know won't react um, so quickly so that they can start to lower their expectation and anxiety level. And that's not kind of pandering to them or? No, I mean, we, we I, get, I, 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 I get it. Some people are going to be saying, oh, well, you just, you know, moving them around to pander to that child, I get that. But then would you say the same if you were doing it for maths or doing the same for English? So if that child couldn't manage number bonds to 10, and you've given them solid devices for them to count with, are you pandering to them because they couldn't do it? You're supporting and scaffolding their, their, their learning. So if you're going to support and scaffold their learning, why aren't you supporting and scaffolding their behaviour? So if that child needs to have a couple of steps taken back so that they can then work forward, then, then that's no difference to doing that with their spelling, their phonics, their handwriting, their maths, their science. So if you treat behaviour as a normal national curriculum subject, yeah. then you're not pandering. What you're doing is making them realise that this isn't the right way. This yeah. is not the right way for you to do it. And we're going to keep doing it this way so that you will get used to it and then it'll become normal and your anxiety level will drop. So do you think that all children can learn or most children can learn to behave in you know, a socially acceptable way, or are there exceptions? There are exceptions, um, but the vast majority of us have managed social interaction quite well. You know, most, most of us are fairly decent at knowing that it's not the time to go into, say, Selfridges and start screaming obscenities at people because you've had to keep. You know, most of us are quite good at working out what's socially acceptable. We've read those cues well. Most children's behaviours can be adjusted. They can't be fixed, because if you've got behaviours that are ingrained, you know, if you do certain things a certain way, my OCD, for example, is never going to change. You know, you have no idea how calm I am at the moment, Pookie, looking at your bookshelf. You know, that, <laughs> that, that, that has lowered my temperature no, no end, because somebody who understands this is... My colour ordered books. You know, there's a funny story about my colour ordered books, and then we'll come back to you. I, I, it is one of my, yeah, the, the people mention it a lot, and it's a, it's a bit of a figment of fun. However, it is something, if I'm, if I'm anxious, actually thinking about the order in which those colours are does help me, and it's a really calming activity for me. Um, and when I get a new book, then uh, one of the great joys is thinking, well, where does this go? Um, and I had one recently where I'd got this book and I just, I was just having quite an anxious day and things were quite tricky and that makes it harder to work this stuff out, right? And, um, and I'm going, well, is it bluey green or is it greeny blue? I don't know, I don't know. Um, and the book, <laughs> Breaking the Cycle of OCD. <laughs> <laughs> I, can give you a, I can give you a download for that. There's a lovely app that you can put on your phone that if you scan it, it tells you exactly what colour it is. Oh, uh, unleashed my world, unleashed it. I colour coded my entire library in the primary. <laughs> oh no, I'm gonna have to reorder my books again. <laughs> oh, no, no, it's it's a joy to do because you sit there going, really? That's that's what this. Oh, it's amazing, and it's the Panatone colour, so it's it's it's. Please pretty. do actually genuinely send me that. Anyway, right. back to uh, <laughs> yes. So you were talking about so, so some some behaviours will uh, be triggered and that they're there and that they're kind of almost endemic. Um, so, yeah. And then, and then we've got some <laughs> behaviours are down to diagnosable issues, um, and that can be from a mental health perspective that will either not be fixable because you can't really fix behaviour. You will always, if you've 
if you're normally a happy person, you're normally a happy person. If you're normally a sad person, you're normally a sad person. But if, you're, if your anxiety levels mean that you do certain things, then you will normally fall back into that pattern of behavior until somebody's cut that cycle. But it will, it will happen. You're never going to get past that. You know, if you, if you would normally get a bit shouty, yeah. you probably will get a bit shouty when your anxiety level is built up to a point you can't stop. But there are some behaviours that don't alter um, because of the, the diagnosis. You know, if children have got certain ASD traits, yeah. they can be mimicked to fit in with society a bit more, but they will always be there. And it's our job as the practitioner to work out how we accommodate for that behaviour and how we mix, make that child feel comfortable about, you know, if I'm going to display it, Today is the, the day I'm going to display it. I'm in a safe space to display it, and I'm not going to be put in in shame for displaying that behaviour. You're going to help me fix it when I've got got it wrong. When it's when it's got to be put back together. So it's about adapting the environment rather than kind of trying to change the child. Sometimes. Yeah, I mean, for ASD children, I mean, my 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 complex ASD kids are probably the most interesting I've worked with in my career. So they will present. As far as society is concerned, they present as average, happy-go-lucky looking children. They are hyper-intelligent. Um, we have one young man who um, isn't allowed access to the internet um, anymore because he reprogrammed his entire school from a Kindle. Um, Cry coming <laughs> to my building. Um, is it a job? Because I could do with that kind of brain. I'm he not is ridiculously... Um, he is ridiculously fascinating to play with because he doesn't know that it's wrong. Okay. And he doesn't know that what he's doing has consequences. He's intelligent enough to understand that there's a consequence, but he just, it just does, it's not working in his head. That's just not gonna work. So if you say to him you wanted, I don't know, to reprogram somebody's lights at home from a distance, it would take him about half an hour and he would be able to control everything in that house um, to the point when in his previous primary school I mean he reprogrammed their website to display some Im imagery of um, staff that wasn't particularly pleasant and lovely and he changed all their biographies and it took the um, web company three weeks and then they had to ring him because they couldn't undo what he had done <laughs> I'm sure I shouldn't laugh, but wow. Well, no, I found, I, if I'm honest with you, I found it quite hysterical because I kept thinking, these are people you've paid a fortune for, but I've got an 11-year-old child who in four taps and a couple of clicks managed to undo everything he'd done, but they couldn't do that. And he's, he's going to go into specialist private education because um, he really does need to have that gift looked at. Yes, yeah. Um, but his behaviours will never alter you know he he is going to always be vulnerable because he doesn't have that filter that you would that we all gain at some point that people may not tell you the truth mm -hmm. and that the world isn't in black and white and he will find the world very complicated and so however much i've altered my environment to support him the rest of the world is never going to be able to change and we've tried over the course of a year and a half with him now to try and get him to understand how different the world is going to be. Mm. But he'll, he's always going to find that difficult. Some of my children will work that out, but he, he will always find it. And you talked before about how you think that the current situation, the pandemic, uh, is likely to influence on how schools generally approach behaviour. Um, can you talk a bit about that? Like, why do you think it will change? What's happened now that's making people rethink stuff? I think... I. I'd like to think, I think that's a better start to the sentence, I'd like to think that people are going to be more kind. Okay. And so that they're going to understand that children coming back into school um, are going to have anxiety and are going to feel stressed. And it may be their own level of anxiety, it may be assimilated from what's happening at home. Yeah. And that may alter behavioural patterns. So those children who you wouldn't normally expect to be interesting suddenly become interesting. Um, I'm hoping that from looking online, um, you know, and seeing what interactions have been going on with other schools, 
we've had a lot of traction from mainstream to ask what can we do what what routes would you offer um i think people are more inclined to think about the mental health aspect of it and hopefully that will mean that they will hold on to some of these children rather than push them down a pathway that they don't really need to be yeah I i'm hoping that they'll engage with services like ours and like yours so that they will they will manage to see that there is a different route and that route may not work for every child mm, mm. and if it doesn't this is what you do next yeah. because you've got to try it first but we've we've been doing some um trauma practice with some of our mainstream colleagues during the pandemic and so far only one school has excluded a child wow and they had to exclude that child. There was a really, not that I'm a big advocate of exclusion, but there was no other option for the school at the time. Um, but they've worked hard on changing how their staff deal with behaviour yeah. and how their staff are more tolerant of what's coming their way. Mm -hmm. And they've learned some of the things that we've talked during our Julie Andrews training, you know, about how how to be more confident, how to be more nurturing and not nagging children, how to simplify what your requests are, how to um, give them the, the expectation that you will still be there. Things may be difficult, but you will still be there. This is how it's going to be. And that seems to have really lowered that temperature. And we, we are offering our training um, currently free to people um, who want it because we believe that if the social emotional mental health special schools yeah. are not integral to what the return after a pandemic will look like then what are we for you know i'm not here for naughty children i'm here for ensuring that children and and staff have access to the very best quality mental health practices that they can they can access and and support families and children rather than be punitive because we're going to be in this for a while so you might as well start changing how you are and a lot of schools are you know overloading services like yourself and they're overloading trauma-informed schools yeah. um and you know if you look on twitter i think edu twitter is swamped with hashtag mental health yeah um, i'm just hoping that they're not going to do it by playing lip service to it but actually taking on board those those trainings and altering their practice a little and their ethos yeah i hope so too and i think it, it yeah i guess only time's going to tell really here isn't it but certainly um i've had a lot of really good uh conversations and much more widely than i would normally expect to i've come into contact with all sorts of people who normally wouldn't cross my um my path and i think there is much there that's encouraging um but then you never quite know because sometimes it feels like you are living in in a bit of an echo chamber and maybe that echo chamber got a bit bigger well, i i don't know but we we shall see um there's a couple of things that have come up a lot of times uh in this discussion and one is around um anxiety and one is around play and i just wanted to pick up on 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 both those points before we we kind of wrap up so is it you know anxiety seems to come up again and again is that kind of a key reason do you think a key thing underlying a lot of the issues that we see yeah because children children don't know if, if children's behaviors are interesting they don't know why they're interesting what mm -hmm. they know is it gets a reaction and sometimes their behaviors as we said earlier is to get what they want but sometimes it's because they're reacting about a, a situation around them and that could be within class but that also could be outside of out of the building as well and what we've noticed over the past five years is that children are hyper vigilant and hyper anxious quite a lot yeah they're worried about change they're worried about what will happen if and it's a bit like that developmental stage that a toddler goes through that when they shut their eyes they believe that the world really does disappear yeah. and then when they open them up again it's a surprise well it's a bit like that for the anxiety level for some of my children because i think they believe that if they're not there controlling it it can't be controlled and then it'll all go wrong mm -hmm. and we have to get them to a space where they believe that school is safe and school is secure and that you know nothing has gone wrong just because they're not there everything is fine everything is the same and if there is something that goes wrong there are people who are going to help you put that right yeah and i think that's about the adults taking their role really seriously you know that you are you aren't just there imparting information you are a role model you know if 
they need to know that you feel anxious about stuff, that you are comfortable to tell them when you are scared about things. But the world doesn't fall apart because you're scared. The world falls apart if you don't tell somebody you're scared. Uh-huh. You know, you need to share how you're feeling. And being emotionally literate is a really complicated phrase for some people. You know, some people think it's all about, you know, sitting on a beanbag and lighting joysticks and being all in touch with yourself. Where other people just think it's about recognising that that person's a bit wobbly and I'll ignore them because I'm not going to deal with them today. But the, the vast majority of us are emotionally literate. We can tell when somebody's happy. We can tell when somebody's sad. And it's about showing that to children and showing that to their parents. You know, if, if that kid has had a really interesting day, that you're not blaming them for their behaviour. Yeah. You know, you're not ringing up that parent going, your child has done this and it's your fault for why they've done it. No. You know, it's, it's saying you've, you've got to turn that around and say, look, we've made a mistake today. It's gone a bit wobbly. They're coming home. They may not be so chatty with you today. But if it comes out why they've done what they've done, I'd be really grateful to know because they haven't told me that bit yet. But we'll reset it and we'll start again tomorrow. And now we know that we can't do that. Yeah. And that takes all the blame out of it. It takes all, the, all the, the pressure out of it. It deflates that balloon. And then people are happier to share. So we're inquisitive rather than kind of punitive, yeah. I guess. And just, you know, as you're talking, it's making me think a little bit. And I think sometimes when there is that, that kind of anxiety or, or worry going on, um, for whatever reason, whatever the genesis is there, that in my experience, it tends to go one of two ways. Either it's, it's out and it's big and it's loud and these are our kids who are throwing stuff and kicking stuff and shouting and the kids who maybe end up with you. And then there are the kids who I end up um, kind of supporting directly or indirectly who are turning it in on themselves and we're seeing our self-harm or our eating disorders and, and that kind of thing. Does that kind of fit with your understanding of it too? Or? Yeah, yeah, completely. Because and re- and it's, it's what's been very noticeable is how many boys are changing towards our internalised harm rather than exploding. So they, they you know, they're, if you look at behaviour across primary, you are more likely to watch a boy's behaviour than a girl's behaviour. Yeah. Boys are very good at being loud and boisterous, and they're usually physically very big when they, when they lose their temper. Yeah. Girls usually contain it more yeah. and are usually a bit more sly, for want of a better word, with their behaviours. Mm-hmm. Until they get to about year seven and year eight, and then it becomes really big for those girls. Um, but what we've noticed is that that, although it's still happening that boys are being more noticeable, as they get older, they are turning that behaviour inside. And so instead of demonstrating it by being violent outwardly, they are hurting themselves. Mm-hmm. And I, I've, been, I've been really shocked over the past five years about the amounts of young men who have real severe difficulties with their eating mm-hmm. um, and self-harm. And real, really difficult conversations to be had about the amount of self-harm that they are masking and hiding from the world. Um, and when I say this out loud, and I'm, I'm certain Pookie you won't judge me on it, but um, or you may do. <laughs> um, but I've always found it a real honour when they've let me in. Oh, hugely, yeah. And I've and I've discovered that that's where they are, yeah. and. I am, there are bits of me that become very humbled that they've allowed this ridiculous human being to be part of that journey. And then there's a bigger part of me that is annoyed that I didn't notice it before. Mm. And it hurts me that I've allowed them to hurt for that long. Um, And so as part of our methodology now at the secondary, because it's normally around year seven to year eight that we're seeing more of that, the way our PSHE curriculum is really delving into those behaviours mm-hmm. and making it normalised to talk about it, yeah. not hiding it anymore. You know, saying that, you know, we all control aspects of our lives. This is a different level for you of control, perhaps. Yeah. You know, and not making it that secret yeah. anymore. Um, and staff have been, not all staff, I can't, I can't blanket it with that, but some of my staff have been very open about how their lives were and that's really unpicked quite a lot of it for us yeah. because it's again showing you were emotionally open and literate 
that you know you're not standing there presenting as a robot you're standing there saying i've been through this yeah. you know i've yeah. done this myself and i'm not telling you that it's wrong that you're doing this i'm not telling you it's right that you're doing this i'm just letting you know that there is somebody else in this room or in this building yeah. that has been there yeah. and that's been very powerful that's yeah and i think it's it's really it's really brave actually as a practitioner to be you know kind of vulnerable and open in that way but if you're able to do it safely so that you're walking with the child um, and they're not having to kind of carry uh, your burden, if you like, but that they realise they're not alone in it and that someone really gets it, it can often be that, that thing that sort of begins to bridge, can't it? And then talk to me about play. You've used the word play a lot, even when thinking about older kids, and I'm interested to understand your thinking there. I have a big problem. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I have several, to be fair. <laughs> um, but one of them is that school has become not school. Okay. And school should be a place of fun and it should be a place where children can express, regardless of their age group, they should be able to go out and, and do the things that children should do. You know, go and do mini world play, do big role play stuff outside, go and play games, um, not just kick a ball around a playground and become hyper masculine because you, you can do that thing. You know, encouragement of going out and just doing stuff. And so as part of our curriculum at both schools, there is an emphasis on play, both yeah. within the lesson and outside of the lesson. And that's about, in its broadest sense, making things more interesting. So, you know, for me, maths was always a problem, which I find ridiculous now because I control a huge budget, but I, I really do find maths a problem. Um, so we've made that more exciting. So there's a lot more practical stuff that they play with things, put it in the real world, both at the primary and at the secondary. And um, the same for English, the same for science, the same for food tech. So if you come to my secondary school, you will be given a menu for your breakfast as a visitor. Um, and my children will go and create your breakfast for you and serve it and role play it as if they're in um, a real restaurant. So that it forms part of their curriculum as in they're sitting guilds for cookery and they're sitting guilds for food tech and they're sitting guilds for restaurant work. But it also gives them that, that freedom to go and be a child. Yeah. You know, yeah. And experiment with stuff. Um, at the primary, um, my... ...are actively encouraged to role play and actively encouraged small world activities outside and allowed to be children you know the vast majority of mine have been excluded and then been kept at home they don't get to go on school visits they don't go on school journey so we make certain they go and do those things that's that's about going out and experiencing the world and as a grown-up you know if i can't if i can't be stupid if i can't give myself permission to be stupid then i shouldn't really be doing this with children and so for um our literacy work, for example, um, usually there is one book within one class that will require that character to be interviewed. And so I will dress up as that character to be interviewed so that they can do their written work. And so it demonstrates to them that as a grown up, you don't have to stop being fun. You can still have fun. And as you know, you know, if a child comes to the primary, they're not actually entering school, they're entering a superhero academy. And so they're issued with a cape and a mask mm -hmm. and they get to be a superhero and learn why the superpowers that they've used for evil <laughs> need to be changed for good. And, you know, that demonstrates to them that school can be fun. It's not a punitive place to come to. It's, it, and you should play. Play is, play is possibly the safest way of you experience the world and to work out if that's the right thing for you to be experiencing in that way. You know, I role played as a child, I was given those experiences, but children aren't anymore. They mm -hmm. sat in front of a screen. So yeah, play is vital, absolutely vital. And I love it when I'm invited to go and play with other people's children in their schools, because then I get to see how that child isn't being played with yeah. and we need to play with them. So we need to do some learning around playing. I've got a few different um, people coming on the podcast actually um, to talk about play because lots of people have asked me about it and um, it's, it's a real weakness of mine actually. I, I, I'm learning how to play as an adult but I, I never really learned as a kid and um, I'm interested in it um, but I can't teach about it so I'm 
bringing in other people who know. <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be really interested in that because I'd love a bit of play. I mean, you know, last Thursday was Bubble Thursday and yeah. out on the playground all day was just gigantic bubble machines mm -hmm. all day. Um, it, was, it was the most surreal experience for the day, but that was at the secondary and at the primary. And people, people laughed at me saying that the secondary boys would not engage with it. You have never seen so many of them sitting cross-legged on the floor, catching bubbles and watching them change. I was like, you're year 10, you're year 10. And that's not wrong that you sat on the floor looking at a bubble, that's not wrong. That's, that's exciting. That's really I love wonderful. bubbles. I, I actually carry, carry bubbles with me everywhere because if I'm panicking, if I blow bubbles, A, it helps with your breath, but B, just watching them is such a mindful thing. I mean, but yeah, bubbles are beautiful. Yeah, it's, 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 you know, but why? Why do we stop? Because they don't do that in Europe. You know, play is encouraged. So why, why we stop it in the UK, I don't know. But I'm, I'm here in, in Greenwich playing as hard as I possibly can. <laughs> so we need a play revolution. I think that could be our, our mission. Yeah, I, I, I'd, I'd make a banner. I'd be there. <laughs> That, that, yeah. What, what, um, what thought would you, would you want to end on? I always like to let you close with a thought that you'd like to leave in people's minds as they stop listening. Oh, tricky. Because I have lots. <laughs> but um, I think if I, can, if, I can, if I can make people look at their most interesting children and see past the bitey, the stabby, the sweary, the spitty, and see past the things that they call you that you take to heart and remember that that inside that that really angry looking person there is a beautiful young person inside who is crying out to you because they think you are the safest adult they've met that they need you that they want you they may not say that they do but they really do want you and that you take the time to get to learn about them, you will see what a brilliant impact you could have as a practitioner and as an adult. Because if you can hold them in mind, if you can hold them close, if you can remind them that the world does have nice sparkly people in it, then you will have done your job as a teacher, you'll have done your job as an educator, and you may have stopped somebody from going down a pathway that they don't really need to. And you can go home and say you've earned your money that day. Mm -hmm.